the grand summation of salvation is Christ Jesus. He is the sum total of everything God has to say. He is a summation of everything God has done. He is the sum and substance of the Word of God, the Scriptures. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every place in the Bible, Jesus is the heart, the soul of it. In Genesis, he's the seed. In Exodus, he's the lawgiver and the high priest. In Leviticus, he's the lamb. In Numbers, he's water and manna. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet. In Joshua, he's the captain of the Lord's host. In Judges, he's the judge. In Ruth, he's a kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he's God's anointed. In 2 Samuel, he's the king with the house. In 1 Kings, he's the king that blesses. In 2 Kings, he's one who dwells between the cherubims. In 1 Chronicles, he's the man of rest. In 2 Chronicles, he's the cleanser of the temple. In Ezra, he's a ready scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the builder. And in Esther, he's one bringing deliverance. In Job, he's a daysman. In Psalms, he's a stone the builders rejected. In Proverbs, he's wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the preacher. In the Song of Solomon, he's the beloved. In Isaiah, he's a covert. In Jeremiah, he's the Lord, our righteousness. In Lamentations, he's my portion. In Ezekiel, he's a plant of renown. And in Daniel, he's the ancient of days. In Hosea, he's my son. In Joel, he's the Lord. In Amos, he's the tabernacle of David. In Obadiah, he's a savior. In Jonah, he's a sign of the prophet. In Micah, he's who he's whose goings forth are from everlasting. In Nahum, he's a stronghold. In Habakkuk, he's the holy one. In Zephaniah, the one who turns the captivity. In Zechariah, he's the fountain open for sin and uncleanness. In Malachi, the son of righteousness. In Matthew, Christ the king. In Mark, the holy one of God. And in Luke, the chosen one of God. In John, he's the word of God. In Acts, he's the prince of life. In Romans, he's the propitiation. In 1 Corinthians, he's our Passover. In 2 Corinthians, he's unspeakable gift. In Galatians, he's the seed of Abraham. In Ephesians, he's the beloved and the cornerstone. In Philippians, he's the Lord who humbled himself. In Colossians, he's God's dear son. In 1 Thessalonians, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians, he's the coming Lord, the Lord of peace. In 1 Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. In 2 Timothy, he's the righteous judge. In Philemon, he's the giver of grace and peace. In Hebrews, he's the brightness of God's glory. In James, he's the Lord of glory. In 1 Peter, he's the chosen of God. In 2 Peter, he's the day star. In 1 John, the word of life. In 2 John, the son of the father. In 3 John, he's the truth. In Revelation, he's the faithful witness. What we need is not a position, but a physician. We do not need a doctrine, but a deliverer. Not a movement, but a Messiah. Not a sect, but a savior. Not a routine, but righteousness. Not a dead letter, but a living hope. If you're wandering, he's a shepherd. If you're ill, he's a great physician. If you're deficient in wisdom, he's the wisdom of God. If you're lost, he's a savior. If you're weak, he's the power of God. If you're in darkness, he's the light of the world. If you need access to God, he's the door. If you need nourishment, he's the bread of life. If you need counseling, he's a wonderful counselor. If you need leading, he's a captain of our salvation. Ah, yes, the three main points of sound theology is Jesus. Jesus and Jesus. Now my text tonight is 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter in verse 5. And I want to preach it with Jesus in mind. I don't have any use for sermons that don't have Jesus in mind. The text reads like this, And the Lord direct your heart into the love of God, and the patient waiting for Christ. Some versions read the patience of Christ. 
Now this text emphasizes the Lord. You can tell the weight of a text of scripture by how many references in it there are to deity. All texts of scripture do not have equal weight. Thou shalt not commit adultery is true. But it does not have the weight of thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Some texts will be obsolete in the glory. <laughs> thou shalt not steal. Uh, that's, uh, but ones about Jesus will not be. If you're talking about his death, we'll see him as a lamb that was slain. He still will look like a newly slain lamb. Everything about Jesus is relevant here and relevant there. It's applied here and applied there. God doesn't say anything about Jesus we're going to forget when we die. God doesn't produce any doctrine about Jesus that's forgotten on the other side. It all centers in Jesus. The Lord, direct your heart into the love of God and to the patient waiting for Christ. So there's three references to deity. Amen. Now here he introduces in this text two dominant facets of newness of life. And newness, if you don't have newness of life, like you're out. But you can get in. <laughs> and here they are. The love of God and the patience or perseverance of Christ. Those two factors are dominant factors. After all, we did turn from idols to serve the living God and wait for his son from heaven. And the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world, looking for the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are two pivotal things. Loving God and getting ready for Christ's return. Now nothing can compensate, compensate for a lack of one of these or both of them. If a person doesn't love God, there's nothing that can make up for that. No amount of work. I come from a time when you used to get special little bars when you had perfect attendance at church and some folk had them like 15 long, you know, to hang down there. Don't see that much anymore. That's because folk aren't that regular in attendance. <laughs> but I will tell you that if a person doesn't love God, it doesn't make any difference how many bars they had. That's right. And if a person is not looking for Christ anxiously, waiting for his son to come from heaven, anticipating it, it doesn't make any difference what else they do. It doesn't make any difference what else they say. It doesn't make any difference what position they have. They are not accepted by God. God does not, I want to be emphatic about this, because before you can lift people up, you've got to teach them when they're down. Nothing will compensate for not looking forward for Christ's return. Because if you're caught unawares, well, I just advise that not be the case. Because if when you get to heaven, you're surprised, don't plan on staying. That's what salvation's all about. There's only two times now and then. That's it. There's only two places here and there. That's it. And the purpose of God is to get you from here to there and from now to then. And if in the end you go to hell, what difference does it make what else you did? Well, we got a great salvation. They can accomplish all these, all these things. See, God has a heavenly agenda. He's not looking for some young whippersnapper to come up with a new plan and a new strategy. He's already got one. And he's already appointed the captain. So we don't need a captain. We don't need a boss. We already got one. We don't need one. And the agenda is, son, bring the sons home to glory. That's what it is. He's called us to his kingdom and glory. Oh, I love to think about it. Now the Lord, direct your hearts into the love of God. It's like a form of a supplication. 
It's like Paul prayed this, but he told the folk what he prayed. So when it happened, you knew why. It's good to tell folk what you're praying for. You take the apostolic prayers, they're great instructive sections of Scripture where the apostle would tell the people what he was praying for them. Ephesians 1 has one. Ephesians 3 has one. Thessalonians has some. Colossians 1 has some. And here is one. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. I want to look at this concept of Lord, first of all, because it's a little bit hazy in our society, religious society. You might hear people say, now you've made Jesus your Savior, now make him your Lord. Well, just tell that person, please, don't speak anymore. Occupy the seat of the unlearned. That's a dumb statement to make. Amen. Jesus has already been made Lord. Amen. It's been announced. God has made him both Lord and Christ. So the issue isn't whether he's Lord or not. It's not even whether he's Lord of your life. He is Lord of your life. It's just that you wake up sometime and you find out he is and you submit to him. But he's still your Lord. He's going to determine your destiny. His word is going to be final on where you go. I want him to say, Father, he's with me. Now this word Lord is used several times. I'm going to take the position that the Lord here is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ who is how he's presented in the book of Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, he said, Break grace, and grace unto you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, The Lord is faithful who shall establish you. Oh, praise God. First, Second Thessalonians 3, 4, we have confidence in the Lord touching you. Second Thessalonians 3, 16, the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Oh, well, that's good. That's, <laughs> that's good stuff. All peace, always, all means. Jesus can do this. Amen. And finally, 2 Thessalonians 3.18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Mm. See, the Lord, the Lord planned, initiated, maintains, and will consummate salvation. Amen. From beginning to end, he's it. In fact, he said, I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am the alpha and the omega. I start it, I finish it. You don't start it and he finishes it. He doesn't start it and you finish it. He's the one that begins it and he's the one that concludes it. And Paul's saying, work in the meantime in between. This direct your hearts into the love of Christ as in between first and last and in between beginning and ending. The saved are involved in their salvation, don't make no mistake about it, but their salvation is not in their hand. Your salvation is not in your hand. I was taught when I was young, I don't remember who said it, and I'm glad I can't, but they said, now here's how it works. God casts one vote for you, you cast one, and Satan casts one vote for you, and you cast the deciding vote. I thought, ooh, that's kind of a tenuous salvation there. I don't like the sound of that at all. I like chosen in him from the foundation of the world. I like that. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is here, you don't ask the Lord to do something he can't do or that can possibly be done by somebody else. Nor do you thank God for something that someone else did. You thank God for what he did and you ask God for what he alone can do. The Lord direct your hearts into the patient waiting for Christ as well as the love of God. Now the Lord is not a figurehead. He's not officially the Lord but not in practicality. He really is the Lord. There is not a personality in heaven 
on earth or under the earth that does not is not responsible to him and over whom he does not have absolute authority. Now I can tell you by the testimony of a past person that God can make you eat grass for seven years without your mind. Don't doubt it for a moment. He's Lord. Well, here's what Peter said to Cornelius. He's Lord of all. He is. I'm saying this because uh, directing your heart into the love of God, that's a big work. We've got to have a big Lord to, uh, to do this. So he's not a figurehead. God has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name that's named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Of all the multitude, the vast multitude of created personalities that exist, the only place in all God's creation where Jesus isn't known as Lord is on planet Earth. Heaven knows it. Hell knows it. Demons said, we know who you are. Men didn't. So the only place where it's not known is Earth. But the Lordship is still here. Whether they know it or not, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. And if they hadn't, you couldn't get home. These principalities and powers are more potent than you, more powerful than you, wiser than you. They're under Jesus. He calls them off, they go home. He tells them to come and deliver to you a thorn in the flesh, they deliver it. Our Lord, he's Lord of all. He is, I like the way Paul put it, he is God, he is Lord of all, God blessed forever. <laughs> now that's the one who's going to direct your hearts into the patient, into the love of God, the patient waiting for Christ. It's the Lord, he's going to do this. Amen. It's not Jesus as he ministered on earth. That's not who's going to do it. It's Jesus who's exalted in heaven. That's who's going to do it. It's not Jesus who humbled himself. And took upon himself the form of a servant. And became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. That's not the one. That's not the one. It's going to be the one that God is highly exalted. Who's sitting on the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. That's who's going to do it. And I can tell you none can stay his hand or say, what are you doing? Stay close to Jesus. He'll get you home. Now I will tell you this. We have a Lambert's Cafe, you know, here in the Missouri area where they, the, it's a restaurant of the throw and roll. God will never throw you a blessing. You want to live out here in Never Never Land? This is what you get. The only way you get anything from God is he hands it to you. You got to get close enough to get it. And if you choose... To live on the periphery out here, the Amalekites will get you. You're familiar with scripture? Remember there were some weak and sickly and folk lagged behind when Israel was going into the promise, wandering through the wilderness, going on the way to the promised land. The Amalekites picked off those ones that lagged behind. So if, you're, if you have a tendency to be disinterested, get rid of it. If you have a tendency to be the last one involved, stop it. If it's easy for you to forget about the things of God and a lot of other things come first, I'm telling you on the authority of Scripture, you better address this situation tonight. Because we don't know whether you're going to be here tomorrow. No one knows what a day will bring forth. What is this love of God into which we're directed? The Lord will direct your hearts into the love of God. So I understand this is our lo a love for God. It's accomplished within the domain of the love itself. So the love of God is both a habitat and it's an expression at the same time. This love for God, oh... The love of this is the love that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
in as he sheds it abroad in your heart, you become acutely aware that God has a love for you. And there's only one thing that can happen when you realize that. Love springs out from you toward him. I'm, sick. I'm going to go on record here that it's impossible that this doesn't happen. The only way for it not to happen is for you to pass over the love of God. We love him, John said, because he first loved us. But see, it's more than just an act of your will. It is that, to be sure. But it is more than that. This has to have divine direction. Amen. Your will is not enough. I know that there's a lot of battling going on about man's will, but there's, there's not a big deal about it made in Scripture. If you think your will wasn't affected by the fall, like you're just wrong, that's all. I'm sorry you can't teach that either, not when we're around. If you think that everything about man's enslaved to sin but his will, you're just wrong, that's all. Man's will was affected, he wants the wrong thing. Something's got to change that, and it's not going to come from within you. It's not of him that willeth. I mean, that's just, it's just a categorical statement in John 1. You're going to need some direction. Love of God. They say this is the grand summation of the law and the prophets. Thou shalt love. Now, this is never repeated to any church. No church, no Christian was ever told, love God. Ah, you don't think that's true. Well, you see if you see, see if you can find it. See if you can find where that commandment was ever carried over. Why wasn't it? Because when a person is born again, that is what they do. Amen. The direction he's talking about here is getting into the depth of it to where it dominates your whole person. The love of God includes a preference for God. Now, when you're born again, you get this preference, but it has to be cultured and nourished, as some of the brethren have ministered here. It includes a delight in God. Well, Job, he didn't, uh, he didn't have a Bible, as we understand, but he actually knew more than a lot of church folk. He said that he'd rather have God's word than his necessary food. Just give me a word from God. Tell me something God said. There were vast periods of human history when the heavens were silent. There were generations that didn't have a word from God. Why in Gideon's day, the heavens had been silent for a long time. When God appeared through an angel to him, he said, where's all the miracles? What's happened? We got the testimony of our fathers, but nothing's happening now. I said, oh, Gideon, I know how you feel. There was a long 1,500 years. All they had was a book of the law and some vague promises that very few people had. And 2,500 years before that, they had nothing. Boy, they ought to treasure every word of God. Treasure it. Be like those in Josiah's day, they found the book of God in the house of God. <laughs> God set off a revival when they did. Now, I do not see a lot of this love of God in modern church churches. I don't hear a lot of talk about it. I don't see a lot of evidence of it. I don't hear it as themes of the conventions. I don't see it in the how-to books in the bookstores. Why not? You cannot capitalize on the love of God. You can't build an institution on the love of God. You can't make a famous workshop on the love of God. You can't have a fancy book selling on the love of God. It's just something that can't be exploited. It cannot. That's why you're directed into it. The love of God. You see... Men have been made for God. All humanity has been made for God. 
And the scriptures indicate to us that all people have actually been strategically placed in the world by God, both in time and domain. In Acts the 17th chapter, verses 26 and 27, God told them this. Through Paul, he's announced to these Athenians, philosophers, and Stoics, that of one blood, God made all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth, and that he determined beforehand the bounds of their habitation, another version says exactly where they should live, and the times in which they would occupy, that they should seek the Lord. And he is not far from every one of us. So nobody is excused for not seeking God. It doesn't make any difference if they're in an isolated island, Malawi, someplace like that, or the Middle East, or the dark continent of Africa, or here, nobody. God has strategically placed people so they have enough evidence and enough inclination to pursue God. Now, loving God is the peak of that pursuit. When you love God, you're, a, you're, a, you're living like God intended for you to live. Amen. Love Him. The love of God is defined. I don't believe this is a comprehensive definition, but it is a practical definition. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Yeah. What did He mean, keep His commandments? In any other context, people know what keep means. If I, if I hand, give this book to one of the young, young people and I say, keep, Toby, keep this book. Well, everybody knows what I mean. Don't let this get away from you. Keep this in your possession. Keep is not a synonym for obey. In fact, under Moses, said, you keep the law that you can obey it. Keeping precedes obedience. Hide it in your heart. Think upon it. Meditate upon it. This is the love of God. We keep. We hide them in our heart. We don't forget them. We culture the memory of them. We keep his commandments. And it's not, it doesn't leave a bitter taste in our mouth. Amen. Now here's the love of God. From another practical viewpoint. Now remember, the Lord's going to direct our hearts into this. So if God's working in you, if this in fact is what he's doing, to be more specific, if the Lord Jesus Christ is working in you, you are in fact becoming more proficient in keeping the word of God. If you are finding you are able to maintain your recollection of it, you're able to live in view of it more readily and improving in this. Now here's the love of God too. It's not it's from a negative viewpoint, it's not love in the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 2, 17 tells us that if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. Not something you negotiate. If someone loves the world, I'm sorry, we don't care for an explanation. We don't want... It's foolish to ask sinners to explain why they sin. We already know why they sin. We come from that place ourselves. If a person loves the world, that is they prefer the world. That is they rather go to the Super Bowl than to church. I mean, let's just get kind of practical about it. They'd rather have a family picnic than gather with the saints. If this is the case, they'd rather be entertained by the world than built up by God. All right, if this is the case, that person does not love God. What they need is a good, solid dose of the gospel, which will give you a good reason to love God. Amen. Another thing about the love of God, it, it provokes you to seek the things that are above. That is, there's a vast spiritual reservoir outside the domain of earth, of spiritual realities that sustain the soul, enlighten the mind, rejoice the heart. Very real things. But you can't have them if you don't want them. But if you do want them, there's not an angel of heaven or a demon from hell that can stop you from getting them. Seek them. 
The love of God. And the love of God involves the love of the saints. Now the love of this, I'm talking about affection for God. I'll elaborate this a little in a few moments. Now the Lord direct your heart. <clears throat> Not your mind, your heart. The heart is the citadel of your person. Your heart is to you what the most holy place was to the tabernacle. It's, it's the, your heart is the inmost part of you, like your body is the outmost part of you. Now there are people these days that say they feel God in their body. They're not telling the truth. I don't, I don't mean to be uh, judgmental about it, but your body is the weakest part of your constitution. It's the part that can't get into heaven. It's the part that's got to be changed. It's your biggest liability and handicap. The old nature's there. The old man's there. The law of sin and death reigns in there. You mean to tell me that that's where God's going to confirm his presence? This is a bonehead theology. And somebody's got to stop it from being preached. God's not going to assure you he's with you by getting a little tingly feeling in your body. It gets, it's got to get deeper than that. Amen. So he's going to direct your heart. Amen. Your heart's superior to your mind. Generally, when they're spoken of together, heart and mind, heart's always first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there's several scriptures that verify this. That if your heart, your heart controls your mind. If your heart's pure, you have your mind to work for God's advantage. If your mind, if your heart's defiled, your mind, it'll be defiled too. But the, he's going to direct your heart because it's out of the heart are the issues of life. The heart, that's the abundance, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks. So that's, that's the thing he's going to direct in the love of God. And your heart, that's where the Holy Spirit's sent. Because your sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. <laughs> you know that we, that's what Jesus said in the garden when he prayed. He said, Abba, Father. You mean you say it too? Yeah, that's what happens. You say it too. Now the Lord's going to direct your heart, divine direction. It shouldn't surprise us that there is such a thing as divine direction. Lord knows we, we need it, don't we? Amen. Divine direction. David, living in spiritually primitive times, but he was ahead of the times. He was a man that was ahead of his time. His heart was more like New Covenant than Old Covenant. Amen. He said this in Psalm 119.5, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Now, oh, David... <laughs> On the other side, the spirit of a just man made perfect. We got it now, David. Amen. Our hearts are being directed Amen. to keep his statutes. Amen. Solomon, he said to trust in the Lord now with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Another word from Solomon, Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Isaiah 45, 13. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. Isaiah 61, 8. The Lord, I, the Lord, love judgment. <laughs> Not judgment to condemn. These did determinations that tell you the way things really are. I love that, he said. I hate robbery for burnt offerings and I will direct their work in truth. Well, that's being fulfilled in Christ Jesus. It surely is. Direction. Man needs direction. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, said, Oh, Lord, he said, I know, I know. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Good Lord, brethren, Jeremiah shouldn't be so far ahead of the modern church. The church should know this better than Jeremiah knew it. More has been revealed to it. More has been opened up to it. 
how bottomless the pit of human nature is has been expounded to us. We should know this. We can't really determine our way or our destiny. We must have divine assistance. And God does. He's capable of doing this to direct the heart. Now, I'm talking about the heart. God can do this. Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he will. You say, I don't believe that. Well, like, who cares? Huh? I'm serious. Like, if someone says, I don't think that's right, it's like, who cares? Who cares? You think God would allow this to be inscribed in Scripture and passed down through the generations if it couldn't be relied on? God can turn a king's heart. When you, and <laughs> that is the highest on earth. See that the king, he's the most elevated worldly position. If God can control his heart, he sure can control a serf's heart. You may be rest assured of that. God does, sir. Uh, God can control the heart. He can. Pharaoh could tell you. Several times, about 14 times, I think, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is mentioned in Scripture. It starts out, God said he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Then several times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it concludes by all the times that God hardened his heart. Some said, well, like, who hardened it? Well, here's how it works. Pharaoh did harden his heart. But there's a, like an invisible moral line that people can cross. We don't know where it is. But there comes a point where a person's decision is irreversible. And God seals it in stone. He hardened Pharaoh's heart, which means he was irretrievable. This, of course, is the is a sin that's committed when a person commits this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not spelled out in Scripture, and I can see why. I mean, what purpose would be served by delineating exactly when you committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What he's saying is, you better be careful about being insensitive to God or shutting down sensitive emotions toward God or thrusting out of your mind thoughts that draw you to God. Because there's this line you can cross where you can't be forgiven in this world or the one to come. I'm pointing out here, God can control the heart. That, and he did with Pharaoh. God can control the heart. There were, of course, the uh, Israel's, Israel's heart. They did the same thing. They chose to ignore God. And they did it up to such a point that God said, that's it. Here's what he said, Isaiah 29:10. The Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, has he covered. Oh, you don't want to tamper with God. Dare we, Paul says, to provoke God? Are we stronger than he? Now, this is not popular stuff to preach, but the American church needs to hear this because God is being provoked by the American church. And if it does not awaken, doesn't make any difference whether it's this one or where. It doesn't make any difference. If it does not awaken, it'll come to a point where God will put it to a sleep and it'll be, as David said, the sleep of death. It won't be able to wake up. Here's another statement that says this. I'm pointing out God can control the heart. I'm preaching the text that he will do it for good, to bless you. But if a person refuses this, this is the other alternative. Isaiah 44, 18. They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. Hmm. Well, I'm, I don't want to dwell on that, but that's, a, that's a very much of a reality that people need to talk about. God, when we ask, say, the Lord direct your heart, see, God can do this. It is true that it will, as speaking as a man, this is a bit clumsy way to say it, that he requires your consent. That's, I, there's got to be a better way to say it, but that's the best I can say it right now. But he has to have your consent. Not because you're so strong. That's not why. 
but because God is not served or glorified by unwilling service. In fact, he said to the Israelites, he says, your songs are like noise to me. The inhabitants of Canaan, you remember when the Israel came into Canaan? It said that God hardened the hearts of the people, the enemies, so they couldn't, uh, wouldn't let them pass through their land. Now the heart, God controls the heart. That's my point. If God's going to direct the heart, this has to be a domain over which he can reign. In the new birth, this issue of a recalcitrant heart is addressed. As far back as Moses, before they ever entered the promised land, Moses, first he told the people, circumcise your heart. Then in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6, he said, the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord. <laughs> God couldn't keep it quiet. It's like God knew this time was coming when Jesus was going to do everything God said had to be done and God was going to be liberated to bless the people and he couldn't keep it quiet. Well, even in the Garden of Eden, before he expelled Adam and Eve, he preaches the gospel to the devil and the whole human race is present. He couldn't keep it quiet. God's going to circumcise your heart. David, he senses this. He senses that if I'm going to be changed, God's got to do it. He sensed this. He said, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Oh. Oh. Ezekiel said, God speaking through Ezekiel said, I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I'll take the stony heart out and give you a heart of flesh. That's what I'll do. In Jesus, he's done it. If you're in Christ, you've got a new heart, one that is directable. The heart must be directable. There must be some reciprocity on your end. This isn't something you try and do. I want to be very careful about how I present this. This isn't something you try and do. I'm going to try hard to yield to God. This is something you got to get close enough to Jesus and if you can get close enough to Jesus this will happen. The psalmist put it this way Psalm 110 verse 3 My people shall be willing in the day of my power. You can't be in Christ's presence and sin. You can't do it. You can't look at God and sin. You cannot. It is impossible. Peter wasn't looking at Jesus when he denied him. But he was when he repented. If not being directed into, if a person is not being directed into the love of God, and this is personal business, this isn't something that, one of, that we can judge each other on. I understand this, but this is personal. But if a person is not being directed into the love of God, if they're not coming into a, a point where God is becoming more delightful to them, more preferred to them, his will more zealously sought, his word most fervently loved. If this isn't happening, there's a blockage. There's a blockage someplace because this is what Christ does to people who are reconciled. This is what the Holy Spirit does when he dwells in people. This is what God does when, to his children. So if it isn't happening, the Spirit's been quenched the Spirit's been grieved, and there's been resistance against God. Now, all of that, you can recover from that, but you got to do it now. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Yes. This is the accepted time, not tomorrow. Amen. I've asked the Lord to uh, help me in this because I felt, I felt uh, deficient in... Uh, compelling people to come in. Yeah. I remember Jesus gave a parable and he uh, said that the master prepared a great wedding feast. <laughs> he invited people in and they began to make excuse. You remember the account. And he said, well, he says, I want you to go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. Well, 
I want that. I want to have power with God and man. Hmm? I want to grow like Jesus as if he grew in favor with God and man. To be like Jacob, whom was blessed, said, You have prevailed, you have power with God and man. I will tell you, if you can just get people to get up in their spirits, to get up and come to Christ, it will resolve the dilemma. Jesus has been commissioned. Bring the sons home. But the son's got to be with him. <laughs> You've got a journey in the entourage that's going on to, on to glory. Not directed. Not being directed in the love of God. Well, there's no root. Jesus told the parable of the soils. There's no root. The cares of the world. The riches of the world. The lust of other things have entered in. And thwarted the work. Jesus came to his hometown and said he could do no mighty work there. Mark 6, 5. He could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief.